So welcome, everybody, to the next panel, What is the Future of Reporting from Conflict Zones? So the moderator for our panel is Kevin Barron, uh, who is the executive editor of Defense One. So one nice thing, this is our fifth uh, conference, fifth annual conference, and Kevin has been with us since we began and is a media partner for this year's Future Security Forum. He's worked for over 20 years in Washington, D.C., covering international affairs, the military, Congress, the Pentagon for foreign policy, national journals, Stars and Stripes, and the Boston Globe, where he ran an investigative project for five years. Uh, he's a contributor and national military analyst for NBC News and MSNBC. And he is twice the winner of a, a George Polk Award. So we welcome Kevin and the panel. Thank you. And thank you, everyone, for sticking with us into the afternoon hours. Um, my, my name is Kevin Baer. I'm the editor of Defense One. I'm excited to host this panel on the future of conflict reporting. Uh, I'll introduce our panelists to get us started. Asma Khan is an award-winning investigative journalist, New York Times contributing, New York Times Magazine contributing writer. Uh, and a professor at Columbia Journalism School. You're writing a book for Random House, investigating the human cost of America's precision air wars. Looking forward to that. Uh, and it says her accountability reporting can be, uh, her accountability reporting, this is worded wrong. Uh, you won the National Magazine Award, that's what it says. <laughs> Masha Gessen is Eric and Wendy Schmidt Fellow at New America Here and staff writer at The New Yorker, uh, author of 10 books of nonfiction, including The Future is History, How Totalitarianism Reclaimed Russia, which won the 2017 National Book Award. And finally, Nick Waters over there, senior open source investigator with Bellingcat. His work there is focused on the conflict in Syria, including the adoption of commercial drones by sub-state actors and the use of chemical weapons. 2018, shortlisted for the European Press Prize for Innovation for his work. And before at Bellingcat, Nick spent four years as a British Army infantry officer, a year completing an MA at King's College London, and two years working in cybersecurity. Uh, and he says, don't call him a hacker. Uh, well, thank you all for joining us. Uh, I'll, I said I'd, I'd lay out a little bit of a, some, I think, topics or a landscape for us to discuss for the future of conflict reporting. Uh, I've been running Defense One for six years now. I've been at the Pentagon for over 10 years um, and in Washington for 20. And we've seen a lot of change in how conflicts are covered. Um, a lot of that has followed how, the, how wars have changed and how developed, especially if you think with our American lens from Washington um, and that time covering everything since 9-11 to the types of conflicts that exist today. And one of the challenges that I face, I was telling them backstage, is that I work for uh, Atlantic Media, the same company that owns the Atlantic Magazine. Uh, and I work for our, our owner, our boss, David Bradley, who is publicly known as being involved in a lot of the attempts to recover US hostages overseas, uh, including reporters. And so one of the barriers in my own line of work, not only the budget for covering conflicts, the safety of covering conflicts, the editorial guidance, uh, is uh, having the wherewithal to do all those things and to do them safely. Um, as wars shift from large ground operations in Iraq and Afghanistan, where you either went with a military embed in official capacity or you took your chances on your own, uh, as those wars shifted to uh, what, we've seen, what we've seen the last few years in Syria and Iraq, and now into places like Yemen or Somalia or Niger, Indonesia, countless places around the world. Uh, so, Asma, why don't you start us off with, you had some thoughts on the state of conflict reporting now and some of the challenges that we're right. facing. So just to give some context, I've spent much of the last several years doing systematic ground investigation in countries including Afghanistan, Iraq, and Syria. And I just want to address some of the constraints in doing that kind of work that point to some of the bigger problems in the industry. Uh, that actually give me a pretty dismal outlook on what the future of conflict reporting actually is. One of the great things about contemporary war is that fewer Americans are dying than ever before. And part of that is a shift when it comes to conducting a lot of these wars via air and having a smaller footprint on the ground. That's a wonderful thing. But it also has these other effects. It means that a lot of the American public, when their colleagues, when their friends, when people from their neighborhoods are not losing their lives in that war, that they're a lot less, not just interested in that war, but even less aware that it's happening. So you have a public that's far less aware of many of the wars that are being fought in their names. 
And as a result, you have media organizations that are not prioritizing covering that, even though the war in Afghanistan is now in its 18th year. Uh, you have less coverage than you did, of course, when American troops were deployed in far higher numbers. Uh, and on top of that, you have a decline in transparency. And that's partly the result of the fact that when there are fewer reporters on the ground and fewer reporters doing this kind of work, there's less of a precedent and sort of standard set for engagement in the first place. This is one major obstacle, but another really relates to news organizations themselves and what they're able to prioritize. You know, we've seen increased risks in places like Syria and Iraq. You know, it's not reporting on the Taliban, it's reporting on ISIS. And we know what ISIS does to journalists. We've watched the videos. It's what really served as a, as a waking up call for so many Americans about this group. Um, but it's a lot harder to operate on the ground. It's riskier and it's more costly. What few people know is that even major news organizations with large budgets like the Associated Press now turn to funders like the Pulitzer Center to fund some of their major reporting projects, projects that just as recently as two weeks ago, um, for example, from Yemen, the Associated Press won a Pulitzer. That was funded by this organization outside of the AP. So it's costly, it's risky, and more than anything, you're starting to see a shift towards more open source reporting. And, and Nick will be talking about a lot of that. This has made significant contributions. But at the same time, you know, when a journalist isn't on the ground, you're now losing valuable context and history. And I just, I'll give you an example. A lot of the reporting I do is you know, half of it, half of these interviews are just sitting down with tribal elders or sheikhs and understanding the history and local context of a very specific place that I'm in. And so I just returned from Afghanistan. I was looking at both airstrikes and night raids in Helmand, Kandahar, and Nangarhar, which have seen a spike in all of this and military pressure by US and Afghan forces in 2019. And what's really striking to me is that you know, we've seen this unprecedented surge in night raids and airstrikes this year, an increase in civilian deaths, and there's very little reporting on it, but there are a few factors that really stand out to me when it comes to understanding local context and history. Last month, two women were detained in Helmand province. Now, if you know the area and you know local context, you know how incredibly dangerous and complicated this can be. All you have to do is rewind back and look at 1994 when two women disappeared near a checkpoint in Sangesar, Kandahar. A local cleric was upset that these women were detained and he went looking for them. He found their bodies at a nearby checkpoint. He rallied the local community and they went door to door to sort of oust these, these militia leaders that had been engaged in this kind of corruption. That cleric's name was Mullah Omar and in two years, the Taliban had taken Kabul. It originated from the arrest, detention, and decapitation, the murder of these two women. The detention of women is fairly unprecedented in these 18 years of war when you're looking at what's happening in Afghanistan. But unless you know that local context, you know that history, it's very hard to put in context what current actions and the results they're having are. And so we're gonna see a flattening when there are fewer journalists on the ground doing that kind of historical research that are doing that kind of local context that renders an individual's behaviors and actions understandable to outsiders, we're now getting reporting that doesn't prioritize the lives of others, which is an essential part of any conflict reporting. And the third and last result, um, you know, one of the major challenges we're seeing overall is a decline in government and military transparency with these wars. And part of that is just a result of that smaller footprint. You have less engagement to begin with, but a large part of it is actually just a post 9-11 shift where reporters and others have been willing to say, okay, we understand when militaries and governments cite operational security as a rationale for denying information. Um, but I wanna just briefly really focus on Afghanistan for a second and just talk about resolute support, the NATO US led mission there. Very few reporters can get embeds right now. I've been unable to get one despite months of trying. And there is a fundamental problem when the American public doesn't care and when these sort of trends that I talked about work together in unison to make it possible that you know, I can spend my time investigating incidents of civilian death, report them to resolute support, 
and not get an answer for a month. Right? That's troubling, not even to get a single response. And you're writing for the New York Times Magazine. That's not no outlet. But this is the kind of contemporary landscape we're looking at. When there are lots of reporters looking at Iraq and Syria, it's a different story. You'll get a response. But when it's Afghanistan and the public's attention has turned away, when that kind of commitment to transparency and the willingness to really be open about the actions that are being taken, you're going to get both less accountability reporting and you're going to get less reporting that really centers the lives of others and the kinds of actions and behaviors we need to understand most to truly understand war and its consequences. Well, thank you for that. In, I don't know if you were implying or, um, uh, but just last week, the SIGAR, the Special Inspector General for Afghanistan, said just what you were saying. There's, so, um, there's, there's an article on Defense One about it. You can go read it. Um, that uh, transparency is at an all-time low. Um, for lots of reasons, but he really, his job is to be the watchdog for DOD and, and the U.S. government, puts it on, on them. And one aspect of that is the shift how so much of the fighting is done by special operations forces that are inherently more secretive, right from wrongfully, we can talk about that if you want, um, and the, in, the, a lot of the barriers of getting reporters in. Um, Masha, take us uh, through, you've been through other wars and other times. Um, what do you see today that compares to what you've seen before or, or what types of ideas do you have going forward for what's needed? Well, that's a very kind way of, of saying I'm like the old person on this panel. <laughs> uh, and uh, I, my, my war reporting days are pretty long ago. I, I covered um, the wars in the Balkans. I covered uh, both of the wars in Chechnya. Uh, and I actually was, uh, weirdly, for several weeks, the only American reporter on the ground in Belgrade when the NATO bombing began uh, in 1999 because I was the only American reporter carrying a Russian passport. Um, so I didn't get expelled from the city. And now, in retrospect, I, I feel like I, I witnessed that shift from, um, from a very discreet sort of era in war reporting when... Um, uh, for one thing, uh, you know, when, we, when it, we weren't observing bombs falling from the sky, when that wasn't the substance of warfare, and that, that shift really happened in March 1999 uh, in, uh, in the bombing of, of Yugoslavia. And also, I think when there was an assumption that reporters in conflict zones were distinctly not combatants, mm -hmm. right? Um, and uh, you know, I th in retrospect, that was a very brief period uh, when reporters were out of uniform, unarmed, and assumed to be separate and apart from 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 the uh, from the combatants, basically from the end of World War II up until 9/11. Um, and I think it's you know we have to mourn that period because I think that was a, that was a golden era in, in war reporting and what we're seeing now is very, very different from that. And, um, and that creates you know, the, uh, the possibility of, of conflicts that go entirely uncovered. Um, and I feel like I have, uh, you know, often when I, when, I, when, I, when I talk about American politics, I sort of use Russia as the, as the, as the absolute logical extreme of what can happen when this happens. So um, I have that experience. Um, in the early aughts uh, in Russia when I was, uh, I was a magazine editor there, um, basically, people stopped sending reporters to Chechnya for a variety of reasons. Uh, probably the most important of them was that, was that it was too dangerous, um, but also because uh, the state just didn't want the conflict covered. Uh, but for independent outlets, it was too dangerous. And I remember this moment in, I think it was 2002, when a reporter, a very young reporter, uh, wanted to know how to write up a news item. Uh, and the news item was on the release of some Russian soldiers who had been held in Chechnya. And I kept trying to talk to him about how to write it up, and then I realized that he didn't know there was a war in Chechnya. And so he didn't know how to write it up. And what do you do when, when a conflict falls entirely outside the narrative? Hmm. Right? Like, do you write in the lead? There's a war in Chechnya. And now we're going to tell you, you know, uh, what, what happened there. I mean, that's an extreme of what can happen, but I think that's, that's, that's very close to what Asma is talking about. Yeah, well, if Adam Barron is still in the audience who covers Yemen, I think he might, you know, have that answer uh, in the same kind of way. At some point, you have to 
you may have to say, there is a war here, now here's what you need to know about it. Nick, you also are working in Yemen, but in a, you're, you're, the, you're, the, you're the representation of the future of crowdsourcing with Bellingcat, so tell us what's coming up. Um, so I'm going to take a slightly different tack. Uh, how many people here have smartphones? Just whack up your hands if you have a smartphone. Everybody. How many people here, especially the military guys, um, military people, how many of you use fitness apps to keep track of how well you do at fitness? Yeah, a few people. Okay. How many people have social media accounts here? Pretty much everyone. Okay. The, amount of data, the amount of data that we're producing is incredible. Um, and people love taking pictures and videoing events that happen around them. So if a artillery unit set up uh, outside the, the White House, you're going to have loads of people stand around and film it as it fires off rounds. Okay. And people are then going to post that onto social media and show all their friends this awesome, awesome thing that they saw. And people do this even in the face uh, of danger. So there was an incident uh, a few months ago in the UK where there was an IED on an underground train, didn't fully detonate. Um, but you've got videos of people walking up to a smoking, partially detonated IED and going, look at this IED, <laughs> and then posting it to Twitter. Okay? So people are taking videos and images they think that are interesting. But when you go to a, a conflict area or where these kind of things are happening, the local population also have smartphones. They also have social media accounts. They also have the desire to tell their story. Uh, so whether that be Iraq, whether that be Syria, whether that be Ukraine, Afghanistan, or uh, Yemen, you are getting people who are local citizens who are filming, uh, taking pictures, uploading it to social media. So what Bellingcat has become very good at is taking that information and verifying it and then piecing together that data to tell a story. So we've managed to look at some pretty interesting events. Uh, so working out who shot down MH17 or how it was shot down as well. Uh, and probably a lot of you may be familiar with the Skripal, uh, the Skripal poisoners um, last year. And we identified who they were looking at leaked databases. And there's a huge amount of this data out there. And although we are doing some really, really interesting work, uh, I also think that it's always best when it's combined with traditional journalism, with people on the ground, uh, because there are limitations to open source investigation. Uh, not just because of the bias of the people who upload this material, but also of your own bias as well. Uh, there's also biases that people don't even really think of, so data availability bias. So we're far more likely, or I'm far more likely to look at events that are happening in Syria or Yemen because I understand the context and I know where to get that information from than looking at events that happen in sub-Saharan Africa, for example. Uh, so although open source has a lot of opportunities, there are also limitations that I think people need to think about. And it's always best, or that kind of open source investigation is always best when it's combined with traditional uh, investigation with people on the ground as well. So how do you, how do you see all these you know, older and newer techniques combining? Uh, so I immediately have my editor hat on. Uh, you know, we, Defense One, know, you know your work at Bell and Cat, and it comes into our, our play by our technology reporter who is savvy enough to know that you exist, that, that kind of information is out there to help write a story. Uh, versus a traditional field reporter who's you know got he's got his you know his kit and his and his on the ground, uh, and I think specifically for the counterterrorism hot spots that like I said earlier are mostly involving special operations forces who don't bring reporters as embeds or don't want them there or in locations that are so dangerous or remote they're too expensive or too risky to be involved in, and I often tell them this is part of the future is you you, you know you. Silent warriors are great, and that's a, no, that's a noble creed, except in the era that we're in now, when everything you do is going to be on YouTube before you know, anybody can get it onto the AP anyway. Um, so how, how, do you see, I mean, do, how do you see this and making a difference at all, perhaps, in Afghanistan? Do you, do you, are you noticing a change? A change as a result of social media use? Sure. I, I mean, I know uh, Afghanistan asked now because that's a longer story. We've, we've, mm -hmm. we've seen it go through the, the, the heyday of embeds to hardly any now. Mm -hmm. uh, but yet, there's still plenty of this happening. I mean, that's, I, we hear about bombings in Kabul before, you know, you, you hear about them on social media before you hear them on right. the wires. I, I mean, it's, it's true that, you know, news will circulate quickly via WhatsApp. I mean, I'm in, yep. you know, I'm constantly talking to people on the ground and I'm getting reports from Sungin, 
in Helmand province in Afghanistan, which has seen a spate of attacks in 2019. And so sometimes I'll just wake up to really bloody images and videos from these people who are there on the ground, and I'll wake up to them in the morning. And they are not something I can find online, to be frank. They're not something I can Google for and find on YouTube. These are individuals who will pass this. A lot of it is not necessary. I mean, Afghanistan is different. And in a place like Sangin, where there's limited internet access, you'll see a lot of phone-to-phone -phone, uh, transfer of materials. So if people are using Android phones, they will transfer to one another. And eventually, it will filter to someone who will upload it. So there's actually a, a period of time, usually, before something like this shows up online. Whereas in Iraq and Syria, that would move much more quickly. Afghanistan is different. Um, but again, without that public interest and without that public attention, I mean, it's been 18 years. Nobody, nobody cares right now about what's, unfortunately, most Americans do not care about this war right now. And so these reports that I'm getting, these people that I'm talking to, I'll very rarely see it reported, despite there being you know, a wealth of evidence. Nick, I mean, the other way around, how, how, are, how are you interacting with more traditional reporters to get information out? Is it, is it easy? Is, it, is, it, is there a thirst for it? Or is it a hard, harder sell? Because of the, the nature of the investigations we do, I think we haven't had uh, too much of an issue with that. Um, the big example being uh, with the Skripal stuff, we had a partner, a uh, publisher within Russian, The Insider, uh, who went to uh, one, of the, uh, one of the GRU guys' villages, uh, asked around, showed them a picture of the guy, and they're like, oh, yes, yeah, yep. you know, that's him. Uh, but we were also on the, the current project we're working on uh, in Yemen and looking at uh, Saudi coalition airstrikes in Yemen. Uh, one of the other people who has been, uh, or the person who is leading the project, Rowan Shafe, she has spent a long period of time on the ground in Yemen investigating these strikes on the ground in Yemen. And she brings a kind of contextual understanding that I simply do not have. So I'm very good at looking at a video and saying, yeah, there was definitely filmed there. I can look at other sources of information and say it was filmed around this time uh, between in this date range, using different kind of uh, tools to show that verifies information. But without Rowan's understanding of the context and of the conflict itself, uh, we wouldn't be able to do this project. So when you get this combination of traditional journalism, people who've been on the ground, understand the context, understand the local networks as well, uh, that's where it really, really becomes very powerful. Can I just make a really obvious inter uh, interjection? Um, I mean, I think that it, it, we have to think about what the purpose of journalism is. Right? And the stories that I remember writing from war zones that I feel were really important were you know, stories about what it's like to try to get health care for your child during a war. Right? Um, and like following this woman for days as she tried to get through checkpoints and, um, and to get help uh, for, you know, for a child of the wrong ethnicity. Um, and uh, you know, ta uh, hanging out with students in Belgrade uh, for weeks while bombs were falling on their city and trying to describe the change in their attitudes and the change in their, um, you know, and how they became paranoid and how they also uh, became hostile to foreigners and how all sorts of things happened to them over time. And obviously, you have to be there on the ground to write about that. And it is not the same as writing about uh, who shot down the Malaysian Airlines flight, which was incredibly important work. Um, but, you know, what is the meaning of conflict? What is the meaning of war? What, what is the human cost of it? I don't think you can write about it unless you're there and unless you're actually talking to people. That's, that's a good point. Uh, I, I think you're right. There's a, there's a spectrum of reporting that falls under the rubric of war reporting. You know, the, this is part of the New York Times why they started at War Blog, right? It was to, or to restart it, was to tell stories on the ground that are more like you're saying, all the different types of experiences in war that, that, that can happen that way. We're, we're getting within 10 minutes, and we actually do have a hard stop on this panel because the Commandant on the Marine Corps is coming next, and I'm not about to you know, mess with the Commandant on the Marine Corps. If you've met Neller, you know, um, he's a great guy. Uh, so think of questions for us or comments. I, I can see some more reporters in the audience too. So um, Before we, we do are. that, can I just jump in here? Yeah. Because I think Nick should, uh, should really uh, talk about something very quickly. But I, I just had the 
pleasure of going to London and working with him and Rawan, who he mentioned is from Yemen, um, who were conducting a sample of an investigation into a sample of airstrikes, uh, Saudi-led airstrikes that happened in Yemen. And, and Rawan has such incredible experience doing that on the ground. Can you just briefly mention the project and, and what's coming out this week? Because I think it's very significant, and, and they should all know about that. Yeah. Uh, so it's called the Yemen Project. Uh, it's Rowan's brainchild, who is an absolute driving force. So I've been working with her on it, uh, and we've been looking at uh, Saudi-led coalition airstrikes that have been happening in Yemen, uh, and not just ones that have been happening in the last you know, few months. We're looking at them historically. We're looking at them in scale as well. So we want to identify themes that have been happening on the ground, whether that be, say, targeting bridges, uh, targeting uh, aid, um, potentially targeting civilians or civilian objects. Uh, and we aim to do this on a scale that no one else has really done before, at a level of detail that no one else has ever really done before. Uh, so it's really the application of open source investigation, not only for uh, identifying themes within conflict, but also potentially using them in an illegal sense as well, and getting that information to the point where it can actually be evidenced and used in court. Uh, so when you're talking about what journalism is, I'm not entirely sure what we're doing is actually journalism. It's investigation. Uh, and it has journalistic aspects to it, but I'm not entirely sure if it fits directly into that, actually. Yeah. Good point. All right. Can I get a question from the audience? Back, brother. Hi, thanks. Um, David Sturman, Senior Policy Analyst here at New America. I want to ask um, both Nick and Asmad about how you're reporting on sort of um, who has conducted strikes, the attribution issue has been changed by the proliferation of parties conducting airstrikes and also conducting drone strikes, whether it's non-state actors, the Yemen case where at least the UAE, US, um, and possibly Saudi Arabia are conducting drones and then all of them airstrikes, um, and whether you're having attribution issues in Afghanistan or not. David, you're so smart, you always ask the bingo question. Um, this, is, this is something that has dramatically transformed the environment um, it, in many of the places that we're talking about. You know, Years ago, you would have known which conflict actors had an air force and were able to conduct certain kinds of attacks. Today, that field has become increasingly muddled. And I saw that in Iraq. You especially see it in Syria when you have the Russian Air Force involved, you have the Syrian Air Force involved, uh, you have the US-led coalition with a number of actors apparently also involved. Uh, and it's hard to trace back you know, who conducted what. And so when I was in Iraq, I did a sample, a ground sample. I went to the sites of nearly 150 airstrikes, but there was a a cluster-based sample of 103 that I took the coordinates of and, and went to the US-led coalition and asked, did you conduct these? And I had to ask that because the Iraqi Air Force was also conducting airstrikes. And at first, I was told, we can only look at four for you. We can't tell you, you know, it's too much of our time and resources to try to delineate whether or not we did the others. Uh, and it took, it was a lot of wrangling, but eventually they did. And that was, that was something that made that sample valuable. Otherwise, I wouldn't know who was carrying out what and what the rate of civilian casualties actually were for US-led coalition airstrikes. But to do that in a place like Syria is a lot harder, because you can't just go to the coalition. You now have multiple actors. And in places like Afghanistan and elsewhere, it, it brings the challenge of the government that you're questioning or talking to being able to deny you information, imply that it was somebody else, and make it very difficult for you to actually find out what's happening on the ground. That muddling is, whether it's intended or not, it seeks to reduce transparency um, and has the effect of uh, limiting what a journalist is able to do in very, very significant ways. And that's what the exporting of the air program, of you know, missile systems, of equipment. So when the Saudi-led coalition is using it, or when the Emiratis are using it, and others are using it, they're using American technologies and weapons. Um, but there's very little ability to get an answer from them when you have multiple actors in these conflicts. When America sells weapons to these places, they don't also sell, uh, the, they don't also include in that a contract that we have oversight over what gets used where. Like that doesn't exist right now in the contracts that we've had. Um, so it's a really messy, messy scenario. Yeah, it can be really difficult, especially in a coalition, uh, situations where coalitions are operating. Uh, although in Syria and in Yemen, you know, one side has a traditional air force, uh, 
Uh, and so therefore, an airstrike usually indicates it's been carried out by that uh, particular side. You also sometimes have uh, instances where that makes it more difficult. Uh, so the Saudi-led coalition has been admitting to certain airstrikes, but there are some which they're very adamant they did not carry out uh, within Yemen. So that makes it difficult for us to work out uh, who actually conducted that airstrike with the Saudi-led coalition or perhaps another actor who is operating in that space. Um, the ideal that we love is getting serial numbers from uh, munition fragments. Uh, you know, you can identify specific kinds of munition being used by specific actors, but we don't get that a lot of the time. So a lot of the time we're relying on statements by, uh, by particular actors to that conflict, which can make it quite difficult to uh, conduct very specific attribution. Usually we can only really get it down to, you know, this group of people or this side um, rather than a specific country. We're in our last couple of minutes. I wanted to get all of your thoughts on um, something I, I mentioned. I asked a question earlier about the constituency for this type of news and how important it might be uh, both for the conflicts that you're trying to cover but also for the, just the practice of the journalism that we're trying to do. Uh, meaning, um, you said more than once on this panel, no one cares about Afghanistan. Uh, I agree to the sense of I, I know what stories click and what stories don't on our website. Um, and I, you can ask the publics, uh, you can ask the voters, they are asked about what their top issues are. And it's, you know, it's never Afghanistan, it's not, it's not wars at all. Um, but we are entering a new election cycle uh, where there are, you know, America's global leadership, America's involvement in these interventions overseas is on the table with a wide variety of, of, pot of potential outcomes depending on who becomes the next president or is still president for the next four years. Um, how do you see, or do you, even, do you even think about that kind of stuff in your work about not just that it's important that the women in Afghanistan story is told, but that American or other countries' electorates are paying attention to it, and it's getting on air, and it's getting play, and it's reaching the policymakers? I think it has to reach a very high level of writing, because you're now looking at an audience that needs to be, they need to enter this. And so it means you find a character who Americans can, are captivated by, frankly. And so if you, you, know, if you have time to read a, an investigation that I worked on it came out in November 2017 in the Times Magazine. It was called The Uncounted. The main character in that investigation was an Iraqi man in Mosul who lived in the United States for a number of years. And I did this much broader investigation of airstrikes between his story, right? Because I knew Americans would want to read this man's story, that they could relate to him on some fundamental level, that there were parts of his experience that made that would keep an American reader like moving on from paragraph to paragraph. I think we're almost out of time, so I will we stop. We just talking. dropped our time. Do you want to give a quick a reaction so comment? Sorry. Well, people don't care about facts as a general rule. People care about emotions, and this, that is again why we need people on the ground reporting stuff and people who have resources who have who are drawing a salary rather than being paid per story, uh, which is increasingly rare, uh, and people who are also safe, which means they have insurance and you know and it can can work there with certainty and security uh, we have a very different constituency uh, I mean the people who read us are generally journalists policymakers anyway so we don't need to we don't view our role really as introducing that emotion into our stories indeed we try to reduce it um, we hope to clarify and provide those facts that other people can base their base their stories on uh, so we have a very different role to play I think Thank you. This is a topic I could talk about for a long time. Unfortunately, we can't, but feel free to find us afterward. Uh, I'll leave you with a, a couple stats. When you go to the, the Committee for Tech Journalists website, they have, their, they have data up on their, that they keep front and center on their, on their homepage. Five journalists have been killed in 2019 already. 250 have been imprisoned, were imprisoned in 2018. And 60 are missing globally still today. Uh, if you haven't been to the museum in a while, I highly encourage it. Uh, and thank you to our panelists for giving us your thoughts. Thank you.